Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Goal Look look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus, plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yep, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. Welcome in on a Tuesday morning. Glad you're with us. Golik and Wingo, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Hope your day is off to a good start. We'll try and help in that category. Jordan Rogers in from Mike Golik. How are you feeling, my friend? Good. Day yeah. two. All right. Well, yeah, welcome to yeah. do day eight. I guess I dress down a little bit more today. Really? Because yeah. it looks like the exact same outfit. This is all I got. Colors. I'm not trying hard. This is just my wardrobe. Is that denim, corduroy? What do we got going on I think on it's here? a little, is that little a, bit of both. A little health, oh, healthy blend? Is yeah. that a Rogers tuxedo? Is that what it is? It's all yeah, denim? There we go. Is that That's what a good it is? Name. We had to explain. Do you know what, dude? By no, the way, Mike Golick Jr., Trey Wingo, we're presented by Progressive <laughs> Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Pencil. All that That's usual stuff. Now we can get back to the important news of the day, which is fashion. Do you know what a Canadian tuxedo is? Yeah. That term? All right. We're trying all Gene. We're trying to establish that because Trey was one of two in the studio. You Trey didn't and, know? and Devin boy. is my who guy. Bubble held boy. strong. You're had no guy. idea what Canadian tuxedo was. Wow. Well, listen. And I, so, went, I went to school in Texas, and you live in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to me, that just sounded like every day in the great state of Texas, <laughs> right? You know point. what I'm talking about. That's a good. That point. sounds more like an Amarillo tuxedo. Yeah, why does, than a why does Canada tuxedo? get to own that? Thank you. I'm not really sure why they've got the ownership of Denver, but I just know it's been that way for as long I, as I can I, remember. I lived in Vancouver. Never saw anybody wear that. I've wow. seen it more in Texas. Oh. Oh. How great is this? City? Oh my gosh! Are you kidding me? Every chance I got, I got up to Whistler, Hike and the Chief. Oh, yeah. best place. That was a nice extended cut right there. There was. That was messed up. My mic wasn't on when I asked you that question. Uh, so how great is the city of Vancouver again? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> no no Canadian tuxedos, though. No Canadian. Great hiking. Maybe that's the push we need to make to take it back and make it the Texas tuxedo. There's alliteration there. It, it sounds makes more a little sense. bit better. Sounds a lot it better. makes more sense on a lot of levels. Um, so anyway, Mike... It was off again today because he was supposed to be recovering from his big Monday after the Masters tournament uh, with Darius Rucker and everybody down there. He takes two days off of this because it's a big deal. He's going to go hog wild. And Junior, what happened? Rain. Yeah, it's a bad weather. Thing. Weather the great equalizer. So da- it saved him from himself, which is great for his body, great for his well being at this point. Not exactly great for the off day that you allocated for that. So. Still going to enjoy that. We're still going to have to go to work in his stead, but it's good. We got a lot of quarterback news today. We have a quarterback in house, so we finally don't have a D line quarterback hating maniac sitting in that. You know what's season. frustrating <laughs> about that for your dad, though? He preps for this, gets oh, yeah. his body ready for this, gets his liver ready for this. It's like a letdown. Well, I, I, let me just clear one thing. It's an Olympian <laughs> preparing just for clear, an event. Let me just clear one thing up for you. The idea that Mike Golick Sr. would prepare in any way, shape, and form for a golf event. Is laughable. No, no. Oh, the no. Drinking no. Aspect. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the golf is so secondary. The yeah, extracurricular is what he, he was He said to me the other day, he's like, yeah, you know, because the weather was bad. I was hoping to, like, just swing a club once or twice with you <laughs> to see how. I haven't picked up a club in almost a year. I'm like, yeah, the golf thing, no. 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 Send that one back. He spends his life preparing for the drinking and eating that goes yeah. on in that course because it's not just the drinking. It's, you know, making sure you got a cheddar brought in your hand at all Ooh. times. There are important things that, that, you know, he has to uphold. He's got a brand. To uphold in God, the course cheddar of Cheddar brat sounds great right now. Uh, Even at 6 a.m. This early? Uh, by My the man. way, I, I, well, since we're on the weather issue with your father, I have a radical proposal that I think you guys can get on board with. It snowed today on April, what is it, the 10th? April 10th on our way into work, it snowed today. That is just not acceptable in any way, shape, or form. So I'm proposing that we have a new federal law. Any time that it snows after the Masters, someone's got to go to jail. Someone has to go to, this is not okay. This is not okay. What well, Chicago had opening day yesterday, right? For both baseball teams, right? And one yeah. of them got, the Cubs got snowed out. I think the White Sox played, right? The White Sox played. So we just pick some... one person to go to jail. Well, I think we got to pick a weatherman. We got to oh, pick a weather okay. person. I was going to say, like, I figured you were just going to point right to Stanzik. I figured <laughs> this is where your beef with Stanzik was going. There are a lot just... of reasons Stanzik should go to jail, but weather is not one of them. Would this be national? Is it like no, just regional picks, like, in I the think, area? I think wherever you are, you get to pick who should go to jail. Oh, I mean, someone is... should be held accountable. This is not right. This is not okay. Those aren't snowflakes out there. Those are shards of my soul that have been ripped out of my body. It's ridiculous. I vote for the groundhog. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Grab your pitchforks. Punxsutawney Phil? Yes. You're blaming the gro- 
I can't blame an animal. But is, he's setting our expectations. He Plus, is. but see, we don't want PETA against us. We yeah, don't want to right. go down that road. That's we a fair point. Don't I think that. I think we can all agree that weathermen are to blame because they are, they are giddy in these scenarios. They're like, "Ooh, let me explain how rare these eight inches of snow is on April 10th. Isn't this amazing? No, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible, and someone should be held accountable. Should, are you with me on this? I am with you on this. Thank should you. one of us go to jail every time we don't start off the top by six oh five? No, that's a separate issue entirely. We can have that discussion. That's more of a that's more of a state law than a federal law. <laughs> I like that. I like listen. I like the Hunger Games style reaping here of weathermen. Allie, you it, line them all up. Yeah. Uh, yes, Allie, put it on the Twitter poll. Should someone be held accountable and go to jail every time it snows after the match? Especially when they set you up like it's not going to happen, and then True. you don't wear a jacket and yeah. it's snowing. And you you don't have your your Canadian tuxedo on. All right, here we go. Let's start off the top. It's time for Off the Top. Whether you like it or not, it's just beginning. With Golik and Wingo. Well, we've got one day left in the NBA regular season and one playoff spot still up for grabs. Three teams clinched berths in the Western Conference on Monday. Spurs, Thunder, and Pelicans all secured their spots in the postseason with wins. It is the 21st straight playoff appearance for the San Antonio Spurs, tied for the second longest streak in NBA history. Just a monstrous accomplishment for them. We were thinking about it this morning. Allie and I were talking. I can't think, and Trey, you might be more apt just because of the sands of time for you, what you've done for 21 years straight that you can really count on. Because for the Spurs... Showed up here. <laughs> Very true. There you go. All right, that's an I mean, impressive not, one not in its own here, right. here, but in the building in general. Yeah, no, in this general yeah. area. That's impressive in its own right, because for well, Greg Popovich, you. you could argue that this might be his best coaching job. Brad Stevens is going to get a lot of shine in the Eastern Conference for what he's done with a Celtics team that's been a triage unit for most of the season. But to do it without your best player, the guy that was supposed to lead your franchise going forward, a lot of respect for Greg Popovich in this aging roster. There is nothing I've done for 21 straight years. No. Except for number one and number two. Other than that, it's absolutely well, you've nothing. Bre- you've breathed for two. Well, yeah, years. yeah. You know what? I like uh, Pelicans, Anthony Davis. You want your stars in the playoffs. Absolutely. He's going to have an opportunity. I think he, what, he's only been in the playoffs once before, right? Yeah. Anthony Davis? Yeah, I think so. So for him, for the Oklahoma City Thunder, who were getting ready to maybe wear that egg on their face, if that roster that came together fell short of that goal, a lot of teams checking that box, thankfully. I'm not sure that uh, checking in right now is the seventh seed, really. Ticks a lot of boxes for what was expected from the Oklahoma City Thunder, but they're there. Yeah, they're there. A lot better than not making it. That's also true. If if it's a black and white thing, if it's a zero-sum game, they're on the right side of it, no question. But to your point about the Spurs, the Spurs have had a lot of winning moments under Greg Popovich's tutelage. Tutelage, that's a great word. And winning moments brought to you by La Quinta Inns and Suites. That's a great Inns and Suites. Book at LQ.com and win at business. Did you mention the Thunder? Why, yes, I did. Off the top. We continue because Russell Westbrook racked up a season-high 18 rebounds, 13 assists, and 23 points in the win over the Heat. This was not a surprise because now it's all set up for what we knew was going to happen. Oh, yeah. Westbrook needs 16 boards against the Grizzlies in the regular season finale on Wednesday to average a triple-double for a second straight year. He needed 17. He gets 18. That's just the ultimate troll. He's like, guys, I... I don't want no drama for this last game. I want everybody watching me, so I'm going to do just enough so I know I can still get it. And his teammates did just enough, too. You saw everyone kind of going to work a little bit extra to clear out space and make sure he got it. Because we all understand where the importance is. In what world do we lead the stat line with rebounds? I haven't heard of an 18-13-23 and 23 game <laughs> like that. It's like we're doing the dates From a guard. in Germany. Yeah, exactly. From a guard. So Listen, we're just shaping the story as it's being unfolded, right? Okay, is there any doubt in anybody's mind that he may get 16 boards by the end of the third quarter in, no. in Wednesday's game? He's I mean, not, he this, wants, this is going, this is going to be put to bed rather early. Don't you think? As quickly as possible. He wants a fourth quarter where he doesn't have to worry about that. And it just shows us it is kind of silly and arbitrary, the fact that this was the defining characteristic for his MVP campaign last yeah, season. And no one seems to care. And he's year. about to do it two years in and, a row. Which has never happened. Never and happened. And no one seems to care. Kind of a big deal. Yeah, we, we're just sort of moving on. Oh, yeah, that's great. It was wonderful. Oh, you've done it already? Okay. Brett, do you have some historical perspective? Because Brett, our researcher, is now part of the show. Do you have some sort of his perspective you'd like to share with us? Uh, I was just thinking of the, the famous Ricky Davis game where he where he put the ball off of his his defensive rim, yeah. so that he could get a so he get a rebound. Absolutely, I I don't think Westbrook would stoop that low. He might, but why would you not? I, I was going to say absolutely. To Are we watching a different Russell Westbrook? This guy yeah. does not seem <laughs> above that at all. <laughs> no, then Brett, this is your guy. He's a UCLA guy. He is my guy. You, I'm just you, saying, you he's know, so crazy that he would he would do something like 
he would be totally reckless, but I don't yeah. know that he would go back the other direction. How many rebounds do you think Josh Rosen would get in an NBA game? Oh, I mean, 15 by halftime, probably. Again, did you guys know that at one point, Brett lived in the same apartment where Josh Rosen now lives? I mean, this is a this is a big thing. It's fascinating. In, in did Brett's he have a hot tub? World. Never heard that in before. In his apartment back then? Brett's actually seen the hot tub. Been Brett in the bought hot tub. it from him. I, I, I think Brett bought him the hot tub. All right. oh, Off the top. the top. That's we a booster. Uh, the reigning NL and AL Cy Young winners both pitched great on Monday. Max Scherzer and Corey Kluber combined to strike out 23 over 17 scoreless innings while allowing two hits each. It's the first time that both reigning Cy Young winners threw eight scoreless innings, allowing two or fewer hits on the same day. And that is a very specific stat brought to us by the Elias Sports Bureau, Mike. It's what they do best and, and what these two guys do best. It's interesting now as we start to get into the meat of the Major League Baseball season, get out of that initial glow. Sure. Who's going to start to pop up again storyline wise? Because we're going to mention these two Cy Young winners, obviously, but you look at one of his teammates in Bryce Harper, a guy who has started this season on fire. And because of the success of Shohei Itani, because of the struggles of Giancarlo Stanton, we haven't even gotten to what could be the meat of the Major League Baseball diet for the season. Doesn't it feel like Harper's got something to prove this year, too? Does Contract he? year? Uh, I, I think people are going to throw buckets of money at Bryce Harper. Oh, my regardless. gosh. I mean, I mean, look, he may be, I mean, they, as a team, they might like actually to try and win a postseason series. Should they get there, that may be something to prove. I'm pretty sure Bryce Harper has very little to prove. At Bryce this Harper point. is is the Russell Westbrook of MLB from That's, an attitude standpoint, from a hustle, from an effort standpoint. I think there's a lot of similarities between those two players. Absolutely genuine anger, yes, it seems yes, to yes. be in a lot of situations. And for Bryce Harper, he was also that guy for a while that looked like he was ready to take up that mantle of the new wave of baseball, the make baseball fun again movement. He was a guy that was vocal and brash in a sport that doesn't really reward that. And it's been interesting. Last season, struggled a little bit, dipped production-wise compared to his normal relative status of unbelievable like we're seeing right now but maybe you wonder if that's the something to prove that hey i'm still the guy you should be paying attention to not these other jokes doesn't need to prove his facial hair uh, no No. uh, his 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 hair game is long and strong um but i just uh, i to me i don't think anything's changed with bryce harper i mean has there anybody that's i get it aaron judge sort of took the world by storm last year for the yankees but i don't think the body of work obviously because it's just one season for i still think of harper as that guy right don't you still think of harper as that as the young guy who's still the, the standard set? I do, but it was just interesting watching him take a back seat. And I think like, you know, we'll take the Russell Westbrook and we'll move it over to LeBron James. I think like that regard, a guy who's that good and understands he's that good also believes he should be talked about mm. more than he is. And I think if nothing else, that might bother him. A guy who clearly has rabbit ears and listens to enough might say, hey, listen, we need to divert the attention back to where it needs to be because I've been doing this, to Trey's point. Yeah, and, and let's uh, throw a little out for Max Scherzer in this uh, great day that both he and Corey Kluber had. Scherzer also had his first ever stolen base in this game. Wow. So i got to give a little tick to Max Scherzer for looking at the kluber Scherber showdowns from last night and who pitched better. Yeah, that was great, but Scherzer actually stole the base, so kudos to you. Off the top. And then the Yankees and Red Sox meet for the first time this season as they begin a three-game series on Tuesday, 7 o'clock Eastern on ESPN. Red Sox H Chris Sale gets the first crack at the Yankees' hit-or-miss lineup, and we mean hit-or-miss, hit-or-miss, because Aaron Judge is 0-for-12 with 10 strikeouts against Sale, and then, of course, Giancarlo Stanton is... Never face sale, but he's doing okay in the strikeout department. And by okay, I mean he has an MLB worst 20 strikeouts already this year. And 10 in two games. If Stanton thought the boos were loud now, go out and whiff three times against the Red Sox. Come and find out. We heard people start to rumble of the pressure of New York getting to him. Yeah. You're right. Let's, We've said, let's stop that now, can we? Oh, no. It's, can it's, we just stop that? It's 10 games in? It's ridiculous. And the point I've made is it only gets worse. Trey clearly didn't yeah, understand. It, well, <laughs> Did I miss something? What? We're, we're, you said we're only 10 games in, right? But yesterday, you were coming at me with all the historical context, like, this is unbelievable. No, and now you're it's giving, never, him, a, no, no, you're I'm giving saying, him a pass? No, I'm saying it's never happened before, but I'm not going to say his entire season is going to be this way. But I just what don't if he comes that. out and starts whiffing against the Red Sox? I mean, that pressure is going to get hot seat. Well, listen... The more he strikes out, the more pressure there's going to be. I'm just, I'm going to take the long view on Giancarlo okay. Stanton. I mean, it's been a horrible start. There's no way around that. But if you're asking me based on everything we've seen from Giancarlo Stanton, do you expect him to strike out five times in a game, uh, twice every 10 games? The answer is no. It's never happened before. It's just a horrendous start. That's all it is. And it could start to get worse. And I, I get Jordan's point in this and the fact that there are going to be things that mean more along the way. And that was, 
Really, my idea from the beginning was this isn't pressure now. The pressure will come later on because of the expectations for this team, because of what people expect them to do, because of what Judge did in those pinstripes last year. And when you start playing your rival who started the season off pretty darn good in the Red Sox, who may never lose again. Well, that's my favorite thing about the Red Sox and what they've done. Game one, they did something last year they hadn't done all year, which is blow a lead of four runs or more. And they lost. And they put together eight. It so rattled them, they found a way to win eight straight games. And we'll see what happens going forward as Chris Sale and the Yankees, uh, Chris Sale and the Red Sox take on the Yankees. By the way, in this idea of pressure cooker, uh, for Giancarlo Stanton, someone has weighed in already, as you might expect. Giancarlo Stanton, look, man, somewhere in your car, you listening right now, probably showing up for bat practice, whatever the case may be. Let me say this to you, Giancarlo Stanton. I'm happy that you're a New York Yankee. I'm happy that you're a New York Yankee. You smacked 59 home runs last year. You won the National League MVP. You are a stud personified. I get it. Damn it, you can't strike out five times in one game. You can't do it. You can't do it. It has to stop. It has to stop. You just can't do something like that, man. Okay? You just can't do that. Stanton, I mean, come on. Five strikeouts in one game again? This is the second time. It's the second time. That can't happen. Uh, Stephen A., it has happened. And it's happened twice. So you can screech about it all you want. It's happened. And it's not the end of the world. If, if, if he's batting 187 in July, scream all you want. It's just a bad start. That's all it is. Do we think he's afflicted with Ed Whitson disease at this point? Do we really think that? Do you know what Ed Whitson is? Congrats, no on, congrats on the reference that evaded literally the rest of the studio <laughs> and staff. Ed Whitson was a Yankees pitcher in the '80s that came over from the Padres, and he admitted to having nausea and like could not handle pitching in New York. Do we really feel like that's going to happen, to Giancarlo Stanton? That he's really going to fall apart that quickly? The answer is no. The answer, of course, not is no. I Take mean, the long view. Could we have like maybe used like a Randy Johnson, someone that people might have known, little, something mm. like that, a little more in the middle there? I mean, I res- that's fine. I respect the deep but, but, cut but, right there. But by I the just... way, just so you know, when Randy Johnson struggled, they referred to it as the Ed Whitson situation. So I, I always go with the originator. Really? I the go Ed the... Whitson? All right, but put it on the poll, the hey, Ed Brett, Whitson situation. Hey, listen, I, I, I have no problem teaching you guys up. I got no issues can, with can that. Can we get Stephen A. Brett, to call look it up, our, our weatherman? Oh, that's we, that's what you need. Ooh, you that's can't do really it. Good. That's, that's, you can't. That's not really supposed good. to be snow. You can't do it. Yeah, um, he that, should be the judge that gets to decide which of the weathermen yes. goes to jail. He should hand down the verdict. And, and you know what he should say to these weathermen when they talk about more snow? Oh hell no! Oh <laughs> hell no! So Stephen A is just our personified sort of extra body on this show at this point. We're going to play all those cuts as long as we can. Again, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I would like to care about one thing in my life as much as Stephen A. cares about everything in his life. I would love to have that much energy about one thing, one thing that he has about everything. I would like to be able to confidently assume that Giancarlo Stanton is listening to my radio show I as I sit say, there and rip right? him. That, that was another one. I know you're listening. Really? Do you know that? See, Are I, you sure about that? Sitting in your car. <laughs> Probably going to batting practice. I said this yesterday because I saw after the Cleveland Cavaliers who were playing in New York finished the game, they're in Madison Square Garden. There's a lot of celebrities. And LeBron James just casually got to go and high five Chris Rock and Aziz Ansari and Michael Strahan and you know missed Patrick Reed who's getting ready to come on with us. The Masters winner got no love on the sideline there. I would like to walk off the radio set one day, turn off the microphone, and just get to casually dab a bunch of celebrities. That's what I feel like life is like for Stephen A. Smith, where he just walks out the studio and that's a line of people waiting for him like that to receive him. Probably. Probably. So we appreciate his uh in- input on Giancarlo Stanton, but again, it it can't happen. It has. It's happened twice. The question is, can it happen again? That, that's 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 the bigger issue going forward. Golik and Wingo presented by Progressive's Home Insurance. Get your quote at progressive dot com today. Okay, so again, we've got this one game showdown now uh, between Minnesota and Denver on Wednesday night for the eighth and final playoff spot. So let me ask you guys this, uh, because we're trying to shape up uh, the final playoff situation in the NBA. What is more compelling to you? To see who gets in the, uh, the postseason in the West between Minnesota and Denver because, you know, Minnesota is, Tom Thibodeau is an interesting dude and obviously Carl Anthony Towns is one of the best players in the game and he might be interesting to see what happens with him in the postseason. So you're more concerned about who locks down the eight or are you more concerned about who locks down the three in the East, whether it's Philadelphia or Cleveland? I think, I was going to say it's got to be the three. I mean, do we really care about who locks up the eight? Yes, yeah, so it would be great to see Carl Anthony Towns, a young player who's going to be very good in this game for a long time, play in the playoffs, but come on. 
that's shuffling deck chairs in the Titanic over on that side. What's interesting is the three seed, I feel like if anyone should care about it, it's probably the Toronto Raptors because the longer you can avoid the Cavaliers in the Eastern See, there Conference you go. playoffs, there you go. the greater chance you have of at least walking out of this with some semblance of pride because you are going to lose to the Cavs. It's just a matter of when. And for the Cavs, what, that means they could possibly line up with the Celtics in round two? Yes, I, I believe, believe so. I believe that Celtics would spit them out there. That would be a good matchup for the Cavs. So all in all, that three seed going to end up being a lot more important than whatever team is going to get mowed down by the Houston Rockets first. So again, that's really the Mode. drama left in the in the NBA's regular season. Who gets the eighth seed in the West and who gets the three seed in the East between Cleveland and Philadelphia? We'll parse that a little bit later when Brad Stevens, the Celtics head coach, will join us uh, later on this morning on Golik and Wingo. we got a lot of guests coming up. Herm Edwards, Arizona State head coach, will join us uh, to talk about a situation that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Plus, Eddie Olchek from NBC Sports. We'll uh, be by to talk about the NHL postseason. By the way, the greatest postseason, don't at me on that, the greatest postseason you will ever experience, whether in person or watching, NHL playoffs and the quest for the chalice, it is the best thing going. 8 o'clock Eastern, Patrick Reed will join us, 2018 Masters champion. As I said, Brad Stevens will join us at around 8.30. Our ESPN NFL insider, Lewis Riddick, will join us at 9 as we get closer and closer to the start of the draft. And at 9.30, Mikhail Bridges of the champion Villanova Wildcats will join us in studio to talk about what next for him. Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Love scoring amazing hotel deals? Then you've got to get the Hotel Tonight app. Forget scrolling through never-ending lists of hotels. Hotel Tonight shows you a select list of incredible deals at hotels you actually want to stay at. And even though the name's Hotel Tonight... You can book up to a hundred days in advance in top destinations and up to a week in advance everywhere else. Want to get those deals? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Download the Hotel Tonight app now. Golkin Wingo with you on ESPN Radio and ESPN News presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests will join us on the Shell Penzoil Performance Line. Uh, Jordan Rogers here as well as Mike Golick Jr., Trey Wingo. Mike Golick is, uh, not recovering from what would have been an epic outing because he did not actually play golf with Darius Rucker and company. He only got it went five holes, and then the rains came. Five holes, and then the rains got him. So dad's liver is safe. Dad's golf game is still not exposed, which is probably for the best. Yeah, we'll have to expose it later on this uh, later on this summer at some point. We got to get him out, and I, I got to see this. I got to see the whole thing in its entirety. You know what it is? Is he's frustratingly athletic in a lot of senses, even as even in his advanced age when the injury is taken hold, and he's good enough at golf to go. Man, if he probably put some time into this, he could be decent. He just does not care enough. Golf is a vessel for drinking and eating outdoors for him, and that is as far as it'll ever go. Hey, at least he knows who he is. By the way, you guys were giving me all kinds of grief when I mentioned Ed Whitson, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Buster Olney, I think we all know that he is a uh, uh, a baseball historian. Baseball enthusiast, someone who knows the game. He's, Milker. A, he's, he's a sage, he's a guru. You know, he's someone who knows. Uh, Buster tweeted, brilliant and appropriate Ed Whitson reference when goes, I understood. They say if you can reach one person, you're fine. And if, and if that person is Ed Whitson and Buster only, I'm okay with it. Again, we were talking about Giancarlo Stanton's struggle where he had two straight or two games already this year where he's had the platinum sombrero, five strikeouts and no hits. And people are suggesting he already can't handle the pressure in New York. And I said, that's kind of ridiculous. It's not like he's going to suffer from Ed Whitson disease. Ed Whitson was a free agent that signed with the Yankees in the eighties and literally like couldn't handle pitching in New York. Uh, he played for five teams in his career, had a 5.38 ERA with the Yankees under 3.75 with every other team. And he complained of, like, nausea and stomach pains whenever he pitched at Yankee Stadium. Thus, it became Ed Whitson disease. And I was talking to you clowns because you said, well, Randy Johnson would have been a, a more appropriate reference. Yes, in the sense that it happened more recently, but when it happened to Randy Johnson, you know what they called it? Ed Whitson disease. You always go with the originator. Steve Blast disease is when someone loses their ability to throw strikes. Rick and Keel happened to him more recently, but they don't call it Rick and Keel disease. They say Rick and Keel suffered from Steve Blast was, disease. Was Ed's... Disease started. Was that his last stop at New York? I don't believe so. He moved on and pitched better somewhere else. Oh, so there you go. You know what, Trey? Maybe it just wasn't very good. 
Well, he was better everywhere else than he was in New York. You know what, Trey? Congratulations. Our audience and the old folks' homes across America just stood up out of their wheelchairs to applaud you. Finally, talking oh, about yes. it. Thank yeah. you, Trey. All, all I'm trying to do is teach you guys that things happened before you were born. There's this wonderful Don't thing called, it. There's nah. this wonderful thing called history, and if you study it, it may help you have a better appreciation for the entire world. You guys have heard of Ernest Hemingway, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Twice. Well, they're not complete morons. Congratulations. B- because Andrew Luck is trying to come back from what would be a shoulder situation. Obviously, he missed all of last year. Uh, and he's taking it day by day. And, of course, he has the Andrew Luck uh, Book of the Month Club, which he goes into. And in referencing how he's dealing with his rehab, he referenced Ernest Hemingway. I feel stronger. I feel more fit. That in turn, I think, has helped me mentally, (laughs) you know, feel way more confident in myself, you know, and not not look at my shoulder and say, why are you failing me? You know, the sort of Hemingway old man in the sea when he's fishing and his, like, arm gives out. I don't know know, why. (laughs) So I think I have a bit bit more of a grasp of the situation. See, if Andrew Luck can understand things that happened before he was born, maybe you guys should go down that road, too. You didn't, I really thought you were going to throw in the Play-Doh. Socrates, moron. You mean Socrates? No. Um, but, Jordan, as a guy who played quarterback and has had shoulder concerns, when you hear some of the things coming out of Andrew Luck over a year after that surgery, again, that surgery took place on his shoulder, his throwing shoulder, in January of 2017. We are now into April of 2018, and he's still not fully there. Where's your level of concern? It's it's really, really high. My level of concern for the fact that he's not throwing a football right now is extremely high. I get it that there is a way that you're supposed to rehab. There's a process. You have to do it right. And he even alluded to the fact that he hasn't done it right a lot of times and probably hurt himself. But you haven't picked up a football and thrown it over a year out. And, and furthermore, when I listen to him, I, I don't care what he said because you're going to say the right things. When I listen to him, it doesn't sound like a guy that's confident he's going to be playing this season. Not that he'll be ready to throw or that he'll be throwing, but that he I don't believe he'll be stepping on the field when the season starts. I didn't I didn't hear any confidence that told me that. Yeah, and for an organization that's come out and tried to have that confidence on his behalf, we've heard from Jim Irsay, we've heard from everyone around him trying to make it sound like this process is much further along than it is because they are rightly scared by that. To your point, the confidence seems like the shakiest part in all this, because we know, of course, along the timeline of playing, everyone gets injured, everyone's coming back from something at some point, and that mental hurdle is the hardest one to clear at long last, but especially for a quarterback, when you're dealing with a shoulder injury like that, I have to imagine that's the most difficult version, because that's your lifeblood, that's what you're built on in every way, shape, and form. And and as a quarterback, it's not just... Is he, right now, a year and a half, a year, over a year out, you'd expect you'd be throwing. Okay, he's not, but you're, you're changing your motion now and talking about things you're going to do to hope that you can play longer. Not good. Let's go to your point here again because I think it's it's very critical that, that what you just said, uh, that he has yet to throw a football, an actual football, some 13, 14, 15 months out basically. So let's listen to him. Andrew Luck was asked specifically yesterday whether or not he has thrown a football. The official football is called the Duke in the NFL. No, I've not. I've not picked up a the duke and started throwing it yet and i uh don't want to skip steps i'm trusting the process that i'm in right now very very much Uh, i'm trusting myself in this process Uh, and when the time is right i'll pick it up again 15 months 15 months after the surgery he still has not yet to pick up a regulation football and throw it that is remarkably concerning on some level, is it not? Oh, it's hugely concerning, especially because what he did mention that he's throwing is some weighted balls and things like that. Well, if you can throw a weighted ball, and I've been through rehab. I'm not saying that my shoulder was exactly the same as Andrew Lux. I did have surgery on my throwing shoulder in college. It's not that much of a stretch to pick up a football and do some light throwing. The fact that that hasn't even entered the rehab process is extremely concerning. Then you couple that with the fact that Now the organization and Andrew Luck are speaking about ways that he can change his mechanics, particularly lower body mechanics, to take torque off of his shoulder. So now they're not even saying that he's going to be back as the same Andrew Luck that he was. They're not saying that. They're open to the fact that he's going to be back and things are going to need to be different 
with how he plays the position, how he throws fundamentally for him to extend his career. That is not good. Yeah, two things concern me with what I've heard coming out of that. One is that the idea that this late in the game, because we see this with quarterbacks coming out in the draft all the time who are trying to iron out mechanical issues and show it off at their pro day, but then once you get back into the heat of the game, it's really difficult to not default to what you're used to doing. Impossible. And then so number two of that shows up when Andrew Luck starts talking about how he feels right now. He doesn't feel perfectly healthy. He wants to get back to feeling like he's strong, like he can take these hits. That's not, that's the part of the guy that does need to change is a guy that has an understanding of when to take punishment and when not to. Because earlier in his career, I mean, there's been two seasons where he's taken over 40 sacks in his career so far. That's not sustainable. The way this team has protected him or not protected him is not sustainable. And part of that comes from him, a guy who's trying to always make the extra play, sometimes at the expense of his long term health and then the long term health of this franchise in tow. Well, they talked about that before he was shut down. Uh, obviously for all of last season, trying to change his DNA, trying to change the way he looks about playing the game. But that's going back to what we talked about with someone trying to change their golf swing or their throwing motion, right? What when You can do all these drills and do all this kind of stuff, but when it's live and when it's happening, you, you resort and go back to what you know naturally. And that may be the hardest part about all this. When he gets on the field is his ability to not do the things that he's trusted to make him the best quarterback can be his entire career, right? Yeah, can we just put that to bed? And you've you've been an athlete, you were an athlete for a long time, big golfer, you understand what it's like. You do not simply just change your mechanics. As a quarterback, let's say you throw the ball 30 times in a game. Not all 30 of those are where you're concerned about the torque in your shoulder. You're not throwing it as hard as possible every single time. Let's say 10 of those, a third of those are throws where you need to get some extra velocity. When you're doing that, and, and when things are flying around you, you resort back to what your body has done 30, 40, 50,000 times, not 500 or 1,000 over the last year. Your body's going to re- resort back to what you do best and how it knows how to generate velocity. It doesn't matter how many times you practice it. Look at Tim Tebow. How many times did they try to change his throwing motion? doesn't happen. I don't care if it's lower body or upper body. Muscle memory is a thing that doesn't just change. It doesn't. And I completely agree with you in that regard. So I want to see decision making. Yes. Because this is that you can. This isn't Cam Newton, who we saw try and do this last year within the confines of an offense that wanted to move away from him as a rusher, which is such a valuable part of his game that at the end of the day, they couldn't do that. But Andrew Luck, not a design rusher, but a guy that let's say at the end of a play, he's trying to extend instead of holding on a little bit longer, throw it out of bounds and don't take that one big shot in the pocket. Get rid of it a little bit earlier. Those are things that I, I think you and I both agree you can change. As an offensive lineman, you would like to see your quarterback, who you know is your guy's meal ticket, is the reason you do or don't go 3-13 and 13 or whatever they went in a season is because of that decision-making. Look, it's been very difficult for the Colts without Andrew Luck over the last couple of seasons, and the idea that he's still not throwing that football uh, 15 months after the surgery, boy, you there's a lot of hope going on at this point that he'll be ready to roll and be able to throw that football. Because we were having this conversation at this time last year. We mm-hmm. were. It sounds very similar. Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Goal look look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus, plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yeah, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. Hey, Tubby, have you looked at Willie Taggart on uh, Wikipedia? Have you checked out his coaching? I can't, like, get hey, over Tubby Hey, Tubby Smith. Hey, Tubby. Hey, Tubby Smith. I mean, are you serious? <laughs> how many stops have you made, Tubby? And how many... <laughs> that does sound bad. <laughs> Tubby Smith, coach. Tubby. <laughs> there you go. Oh, as we continue on Golik and Wingo, Jordan Rogers, Mike Golik Jr., Trey Wingo here. Time for Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. Okay, speaking of contracts, I think we were all a little bit taken aback when we saw that, of all people, Odell Beckham Jr., the Giants wide receiver, actually showed up for the off-season workouts for the New York football Giants after everything that had gone on, right? I mean, he had sort of made it clear before... John Mara, the Giants president owner, and Dave Gettleman, the new GM, sort of let it out there that, hey, we, we're not opposed to trading you. Uh, it seemed pretty clear that Odell Beckham Jr. was going to stay away, right? That was the consensus and the feeling that we were getting, right, Jr.? 
Uh, based off a retweet, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, well, no, just other things that we'd heard, like he was, you know, he was basically thinking, hey, I, you know, until I get my contract, well, I'm, we, I'm going to stay away. And we had seen it last year. Yes. So he, we did had not, he, he did not come last year. So it was somewhat surprising that he ended up showing up this year. Well, again, these are voluntary workouts. I think people need to understand that. And I'm all for a player. If you don't have to go, don't go because it's a long season. Your body is your own and you got to figure it out. Someone else did not show up. Uh, Khalil Mack, former NFL Defensive Player of the Year, was a no-show for the first day of the Raiders' voluntary offseason workouts uh, as Mack missed the opportunity to meet new head coach John Gruden in his official capacity for the first time. Now, Mack has attended voluntary workouts in the past, and of course, he's looking for a new deal. He has three straight seasons of at least ten and a half sacks and made NFL history in 2015 when he became the first player to be named first-team All-Pro at two positions at the same time in the same season outside linebacker and defensive end. So, what do we make of Khalil Mack to saying, yeah, I'm, I'm good for the, for the now. I'll, I'll catch up with you guys later. Seems pretty cut and dry, right? They're going to pay this guy. This mm-hmm. isn't an instance like Odell where you've even got the mere appearance or the mere image of impropriety in all this. You've got a guy that's been unbelievably productive on a defense that really has no one else at this point. It's about maintaining leverage. As a player, you're always trying to maintain leverage. That's why you mentioned it yesterday. I think Odell kind of blinked in this negotiation or stand. And what's expected for Odell is that, oh, okay, I give a little, I show up, then they're going to make things work. But it's like the first time I went and saw Nacho Libre. Right, I was like, oh, I'm going to see a, a funny a movie. Hold on, and then it's not. Hold on, a that's what's going to happen with Odell. He expects it's going to work. You're going to lose hold, money hold, in the deal. On. So pump, I agree with pump Mac. Pump the brakes. Pump the brakes. Out. We need to peel that one back again. We need to peel that one back again. You just compared the Odell Beckham situation and Khalil Mack to Nacho Libre holding your leverage as long as possible as a player. What's expected is if I give a little bit, I show up for these. The team is going to reward me. At the end of the day, the team is about no, dollars no, and but, cents. What's but, expected but hold on, hold on. How is, is that not com- always the how result. How is that comparable to a movie with Jack Black in tight because pants? Because you, you expect it to be funny. You go there and it's terrible. Okay. So as a player, you show up. You expect that if you do something good for a team, that they're going to recoup that. That's not what happens. A team is about dollars and cents. I don't care if you're Khalil Mack. I don't care if you're Odell Beckham. At the end of the day, it's going to cost you ten thousand, a hundred thousand, half a million. It's going to cost you something when you lose leverage. So Khalil Mack is making the right choice. Now let me be clear. You guys were upset with my historically accurate Ed Whitson reference, and you just compared these contract situations to Nacho Libre. You know what I have to say about that? Oh hell no! Oh, come oh, on, hell no! What a- Expectation versus reality, Thank Trey. You. I think it illustrated the point brilliantly, and it was something. Have you the, seen the movie Nacho Libre? The youth can connect. Did you think with. it was funny? Uh, I enjoyed it. Oh come on! Ah, uh, see, there's the there's did, the, the junior, queer generation. It was terrible. Junior, did you, you expect did it to you be enjoy funny? It? It's not. Exactly. Junior, did you enjoy it? No, I didn't. wasn't, wasn't oh, a fan. Oh hell no! <laughs> oh hell no! I, now I may I must admit I may be a little partial to Nacho Libre because uh, my my guy for 13 years, Mark Schlereth, stink. My other road dog, that movie made him laugh every time, every time, and he quotes lines from that movie every Terrible. time. Terrible. So I will, I will, expectation I will say versus you, reality. I will say to you that my judgment on this subject might be a little colored. Forty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So yeah, yeah. well, forty percent on Rotten check Tomatoes. Yeah. There are a lot of movies that get low ratings on Rotten Tomatoes that people think are funny. So I mean, it, it's let's just be honest about that. I'm willing, I'm willing to concede. That my reference may be blinded by my loyalty to my guy Mark Schlereth. Fair enough, but uh, I, I just I just wanted to make sure I was understanding you correctly. And that was straight talk, by the way. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. I'm sure they're thrilled. Nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. Coming up, a bold claim, and I'm not buying it. We'll get into that after this. Golik and Wingo, stay with us. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance, so he switched and saved. So, it Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Golik look, look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yeah, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. 
Golik and Wingo with you on a Tuesday morning, ESPN Radio, ESPN2, presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Jordan Rogers in from Mike Golik, who is upset that he didn't get to play golf yesterday, even though taking the days off, two of them, in fact. Sorry, bro. Uh, a junior is with us, uh, Trey Wingo here as well. You guys were tripping on me a little bit the last hour with my, with my Ed, Ed Whitson reference, and, you know, people didn't understand. Tripping. Yeah, you were, tripping. Tripping. you were a little upset about it. You were a little upset about it. So let He's me coming ask, around. Let me ask he you guys is. a question. No. You're slowly oh. getting it now. <laughs> well, we're, we're get, I'm about to do the 360 windmill dunk in your faces here. Oh. I, I think you guys are all in on Cardi B, right? Yeah. Did you know Cardi B has a unbelievable knowledge of American presidents? Yeah, actually, I, 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 I saw oh, that on Twitter so the other okay. day. Oh, so it's okay. So then maybe you should get on board here. Well, yeah. The American the things happen before you were born. baseball references are not in the same playing field. One is just a what bit show more is it that we're doing? the other. It's a sports it's a valid show. Point. Oh, thanks, G. But you're thanks, also referencing Cardi B, who's what, not what, on a sports talk what I, show. What I'm saying is, yes, someone of your ilk and your generation understands that things happened beyond her mortal years. Well, yeah. And maybe you guys should go down that road History as well. History started July 4th, 1776, so that stuff's Facts. always valid. And then what happened the next day? No idea, actually. There you go. Yeah, we were, look it yeah, up, we were kids. Free. Some hangovers. Look it up. Yeah, I think yeah. I would say everyone was pretty, uh, pretty toasted. Writer's after. cramp, little carpal tunnel. Yeah, it was a tough yeah. one, man. John Hancock, rough go. Just, uh, just, oh, Stanzik just got in my ear and said, please, God. Would you like to elaborate, Stanzik? <laughs> no. You're not okay. here for declaration talk? I mean, I am, but it's not my job. You don't like America? Come on. Love America. That's sort of, well, that's sort of, well, you know what? I could get on board with that. Maybe that's his problem. Captain America Maybe. in an hour. By the way, oh, so look at you. Way, way to save it. Uh, we will have <laughs> Captain America and Masters champion Patrick Reed joining us in a little bit. Uh, we got a lot of great guests coming up. Brad Stevens of the Celtics will join us as well, talk about the Eastern Conference playoffs and what a crazy year it's been for the Celtics. Lewis Riddick will join us. Mikhail Bridges will join us. And a surprise guest is joining us in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, let's get to... What's trending? And we start with the Cavs clinching the central title with a 123-109 win over the Knicks on Monday, giving the Cavs a 50-31 to record with one game left to play. Now, I'm not going to put much stock into winning the division title because we all know that gets you uh, nothing uh, in the NBA. But the fact that this team can reboot itself three times, Junior, and still find its way to 50 wins says what to you? Uh, it says that LeBron James is just that good. He's just that big of a force. There's a reason he came out at the end of this game and addressed that division title and said, this is something that I probably need to take more of a time to celebrate, especially in this season when you're not the one seed yet again. There's been so much volatility and you've got one thing you can now hang on to, one that actually does have some playoff implication for it. But at what price? 33 years old, he might possibly play in every single game this season with two left. How does that fare for how he's going to hold up and how his body holds up in the playoffs? Going to be interesting. It's a for first time in his career, 15 years in, which seems insane that we're getting any sort of Seriously. first for him, but that's par for the course for this guy. He's a freak. Listen, we always say the greatest uh, ability is availability. LeBron has been available to this team and whatever lineup is around him for 81 games, then you better believe he's going to play in the last one. Uh, he was asked after the game if that was a stated goal of his to play in all 82 games. No, I just try to be available to my teammates every night that we have a game, and uh, I've been I've been available every night, you know. So I try to keep my body, and keep my mind fresh, and then go out and just try to do what I can do to help our team in ball games. And uh, you know, it's been uh, it's been pretty good so far. In this season, which, as you said, uh, juniors is 15th in the league. And we talked about the things that he's done, and uh, he's averaging, what, I think more assists uh, than ever at any time in his career this year. Is that the most impressive thing? That he's been there 81 straight games at the age of 33, 15 years. And by the way, let's be clear, he, he doesn't play, he's not out there in the perimeter shooting. He is going to the rim, doing all that kind of stuff. That might be the most impressive thing about LeBron's season. Doing everything. He's asked to carry a very heavy load for them, and not for nothing, this also may come from a place of rabbit ears. What's one of the criticisms that always gets thrown his way? Well, all the old players used to play every game. Uh-huh. Michael Jordan right. would play That's every game. Point. And who listens to everything that we're all saying very clearly? LeBron James. So it would be very on brand for him this late in his career to say, all right, what's one of those arguments you guys keep using against me? All right, I'll give you 82, and I'll do it quite easily. And I think you hit the nail on the head. It's the style in which he plays that makes it that much more impressive. The physicality that it brings every single night to, to just not have a night where you, you turn an ankle or it, you have a cramp or yep. you, you, you pull your hammy. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. The manner in which he plays, the longevity to which he's had this entire season at 33 is amazing. It, it is hard 
to knock LeBron James at this point. The only thing you can is the free throw situation. When you look at his free throws as opposed yeah. to the ultimate greats in the game. And that's the comparison here. Uh, I think that's the fairest criticism of LeBron James at all time. What did he say? Stated goal this year was 80%, and he's at about 73, including the one that he missed that he had, and then he had to miss the second one and the three point loss to the Sixers. That's a, it, it'll be one of the most perplexing things about LeBron James' career to me. And we remember that one season, Brian Windhorst did the great article about all the times he changed his routine over the course of a year. It's been mind blowing. Well, and 47%, I believe, under 50% in the last minute when he needed it. Yeah. Even more so alarming. That's the only knock you can find on him at this yeah. point. Um, but, uh, look, they're in. The Cavs are uh, going to be a team to contend with. We're pretty confident of that. And they might be the team to beat in the East regardless, and we are confident of that and confidence team. Brought to you by National Mortgage Lender Quicken Loans. Apply simply. Understand fully. Mortgage confidently. Speaking of things we should also be confident of, the Spurs extended their playoff streak to 21 straight seasons. They tied the Trailblazers on the NBA's all-time list for the second longest streak of consecutive postseason appearances and extend to the longest active streak in all four professional sports. So honestly, what's more impressive? The fact that LeBron has played in every game this season with a revolving cast or that the Spurs have found a way to make the postseason without their LeBron, Kawhi Leonard? Well, it's got to be the Spurs. I mean, just uh, if you just sit back and look at how long they've done this, and, and maybe it's just our youth on this side of the table, but I'm going to say... For that team to have that much success, we're going to look back in 10, 20 years at maybe the greatest run by a team, greatest longevity by a team, maybe four Hall of Famers on a team that we've seen. And it seems counterintuitive because we've seen more bodies change places in Cleveland. You've seen more yeah. volatility. But the NBA is one place where we talk about one player can have an inordinate amount of impact on the floor. LeBron James can do that for the Cavs. You've removed the best option, the one that we thought was going to be the cornerstone for them now that Tim Duncan and others were finally on their way out and continuing to leave. The Popovich thing is really amazing because the comparison is obviously Bill Belichick, right? But Bill and Tom Brady have been together for 17 years. And let, let, you cannot say that enough. They've been together 17 years. That'll never happen again in the history of the NFL. No chance, no way, no how. The Popovich angle is so much different is because he's had this transition from one superstar, from David Robinson to Tim Duncan, onto Kawhi Leonard, and he still found this level of consistency. So if you're looking at the greatest coaches of all time, I, I think the one thing where the, on the Popovich camp there's a huge edge to his advantage is like, yeah, I mean, I, there's been a ton of players that have come and gone from New England, but Tom Brady has been the constant. There has been no one constant for Greg Popovich in terms of that one superstar that you can rely on, and he still found a way to effectively get the bo get the best out of every team that he's had. And not for nothing has accounted for a lot of different personality types in that in a league that demands more of you as a coach to acquiesce to the guys in your locker room. We've seen Bill Belichick butting heads with some big personalities on that team lately. Greg Popovich has constantly found a way to connect with guys and a lot of different personalities. Well, and you guys. could say that, that Tom, I mean, at the end of his career, Tim Duncan wasn't playing like he was in the middle or the beginning of his career. I would argue that Brady is playing as good now, this late in his career, as he was at the beginning. So he that threw just for goes 500 to, yards. Yeah, that just goes to, to Pop's brilliance even more yeah look it's it's a really interesting debate as to which one has been a more dominant coach uh, because of those situations you have the free agency obviously with the nfl that sort of helps bill over all the other great coaches that just had a core and they stuck with it um, but the idea of pop doing this with a different guy being the guy is a really fascinating card on his side of the equation and then there's this mark mcguire says he could have hit those 70 home runs in a season without using PEDs. Quote, I just know myself. I just know. I was a born home run hitter, McGuire told Stadium TV. I mean, unfortunately, I did take PEDs, and I've regretted that. I've talked about that. I've regretted it. I didn't need to. That's the thing. Didn't need to. But I know deep down inside, I know me as a hitter. So I think everybody at some point in their athletic career believes that, hey, I could have done all these things differently. Do you guys believe that Mark McGuire could have hit 70 home runs without using PEDs? No, and to be honest, I don't really care. This is this to me falls in the realm, and, and Jordan, you'll know this as soon as I get at it, but 
one of the favorite pastimes in any locker room, if it's a pro locker room, it's guys talking about, well, my college team would have beat your college team. In college locker rooms, it's my high school team would have waxed your high school team. We love these hypothetical scenarios in sports where you'll never have to answer for it. Mark McGuire doesn't get to go back and try and crack 70 home runs without PEDs. There's no chance for that to happen. So it's super easy to stand up and say, yeah, you know what? I had this in the bag. You guys just take my word for it. And it makes absolutely no sense. You're that much stronger when you make contact with the ball, of course that's going to result, as it did in the increase in bump in home runs for that entire era. No way you get 70 without it. Yeah, you were a great hitter. As a rookie, you hit a bunch of home runs, but it wasn't 70. There's a reason that that number didn't even get sniffed for the longest time. I think he hit 49 as rookie, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. And he was big. He was a big guy. You know what? He was a natural home run hitter, but not 70. Maybe 50. Well, again, I, w- I would always argue if, if if it wasn't helping you, why did you do it? Yeah. Why did you take it? Same thing like with the Tom Brady and the deflation sensation with the football. I mean, why would you just arbitrarily change the PSI of the football? And even then for McGuire, he, he pointed out in these statements, they weren't testing for it then. So he was taking an advantage that he was basically allowed to under the rules. It may have been one of those unwritten rules, but. And everybody else was. Yeah. yeah. Everyone else was at the time. So you were doing something everyone else was, but there's no reason to try and go back and claim it. We don't have to worry about that, man. You did what you did and it worked out pretty well for you. And we loved it. Yeah. And I was in St. Louis when Mark McGuire was traded from the A's and look, much in the same way people show up to watch, uh, warm ups with Odell Beckham Jr. With the with the with the catches, people would show up early just to watch him hit batting practice. It was it was an it was an amazing thing that happened, and you know obviously that's the way he feels. We'll never know the answer to your point. It's one of those statements that you can throw out there. Well, it can't be proved either way, so what the heck, right? See if it sticks. Uh, with ESPN Radio and TuneIn, by the way, you've got the MLB season in the palm of your hand. Listen to live MLB games on ESPN Radio and on the TuneIn app, and check out how TuneIn Premium. Gives you every home call of every team all season long. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial of TuneIn Premium. Just go to the App Store on Android or iOS and download TuneIn today and start your free trial. Speaking of free, there's nothing better than getting a free opportunity to speak to one of the best guys I know about topics that are on hand in sports. Uh, I worked with this man for nine years on NFL Live. My road dog, one of the best guys I've ever hung around in my life. He's the head coach of Arizona State. Herm Edwards joins us on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Get the feeling of being rewarded with gold status at Shell with the Fuel Rewards program. Download the Fuel Rewards app. Join and start saving five cents a gallon today. Road Dog, what's up, partner? Well, Roadie, when you gave him a text, I was just rolling out of bed, getting ready to go exercise. But um, for you, I'm going to pull that back and come on your show. And you got young goalie junior over there and. Uh, the guys and uh, you guys are doing a good job. That that Popovich um, uh, uh, Belichick uh, conversation is pretty interesting. It, it really interesting. is, Rody. Now, listen, Jordan Rogers from the SEC Network here with us as well. Rody, where are you right now? Oh, I'm uh, I'm in my office. Okay, I'm going to work out when I get done with you. And, and what time is it in your office? Oh, it is four twelve. This is my guy. This is my, this, understand the dedication to the task. He gets up this early every day and goes to work out. So he is prepared and ready to start the day. That's why I knew when I texted him, he was going to be up because you texted him at two over an hour morning, ago. Yes. Rody is the man. That, that's all there is to it. Rody is the man. Now, Rody, the reason we have you on the show is because Andrew Luck is trying to come back from this shoulder surgery. It's been 15 months since he had that shoulder surgery and he still hasn't thrown an NFL football. And you went through this with your quarterback when you were the head coach of the Jets, Chad Pennington. I'll never forget this. When Herm heard about the surgery for Andrew Luck, the first thing he said to me, it's going to be at least a year. Trust me. And no one was saying that at that time. Herm was saying that then, and he was proved right. So, Herm, what's your level of concern right now when you hear 15 months after that surgery that your quarterback had back in 2000 that Andrew Luck still isn't throwing a football? Well, I think the concern is this, uh, Trey, is the velocity on his throws now. Uh, he's going to be, and I take this from baseball, he's going to be on a pitch count uh, through camp. There's no doubt about that. And then what type of offense will you run? We were fortunate. We ran the West Coast offense. You got the ball out very quickly. Not a lot of vertical passes down the field. This is not the offense Andrew Luck has run in the past. It has been one where they attack the field. They they attack deep perimeters of the field. So it'll be interesting now how this offense evolves around the quarterback, and we're talking about Andrew Luck now. 
you know, we, we, we're all pulling for Andrew Luck. I mean, we know that he's quite a uh, savant when it comes to, to playing the, the quarterback position. But the arm situation now is a concern. And I think it's a concern for Andrew as well. As he said, you know, I want to be healthy uh, when I start throwing again. Uh, he'll never be the same. Uh, when you go into that shoulder, I don't think they ever are the same. Now, Chad continued to play. Um, did he lose some velocity on his throat? Probably so. Um, and hoping Andrew Luck will continue to play and have a, a great career. Herm Edwards with us, a longtime co-worker of mine at NFL Live, of course now the Arizona State head coach. Herm, if, if you're the front office of the Colts, if you're the head coach there, when do you need to see Andrew Luck throwing to know, hey, he'll be with us in 2018 on the field? <laughs> well, you get into these summer workouts now when training camp starts, he needs to start, he needs to start throwing it. Now, obviously, you, you better have a backup plan. There's no doubt about that. Because here's the problem, Trey. He can go for a week, and all of a sudden his arm can be sore. You know, Chad went through that where there were times where he wasn't going to participate in practice because of the soreness of his arm. You can't rush it. Every guy's a little bit different. Andrew's going to do everything in his, in his being to try to get ready to play, but the doctors are going to have to monitor him uh, when he throws the ball. I mean, in, you know, can you imagine how many throws a quarterback throws during the day? Of just practice alone. I mean, not even the game, just the practice part of it. Hey, Coach, you mentioned velocity. As a quarterback, I, I get that. I understand it. But to everybody else listening, as a coach, describe what that looks like. Is that a few yards off your deep ball? Is that letting the ball go a little earlier? How is that going to change if there is a, a lack of velocity or a change in Luck's velocity? How does that change how he plays the position and how a coach needs to manage that? Well, um, obviously, the type of throws you're asking him uh, to provide you as a quarterback. You know, the West Coast offense is a, what they call a dink and dunk, but it gets the ball out of your hand. Not many throws over 10 yards in the course of a, uh, of a game. I mean, every once in a while you're going to throw. You know, just imagine this. How many, how many long balls, when you think about Jerry Rice, did he catch from Joe Montana? We think of Jerry Rice catching what? Slants. Quick stuff. The quick hitting passes. So, you know, that will have something to do with it. Also this. Where is the ball on the hash? Are you playing outside? Is the wind blowing? All these things factor in when you lose velocity uh, as a thrower. Talking to Herm Edwards on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And Herm, you mentioned it. You dealt with this with Chad. And I'm sure you had to deal with the mental side of this, too. Coming back from injury for a player, that's always the last and the biggest hurdle to overcome. So how as a coach do you approach a player that's had this time, type of time off and this series of an injury? Well, it's always about protecting the player and being honest. And, and there was a relationship of the head coach and the, and the player have to really be in step. And there's no doubt about it, uh, Chad Pennington and myself, and we have a great relationship even today. Uh, and I was always concerned and wanted to protect him. You know, players always want to go do a little bit more. You know that. They always want to do a little bit more. And as soon as they tell you, they said, no, that's it. And, and so, you're, you know, you, every day you're checking with him. How does it feel? Are you doing okay? And, and there were times, even during the season, where he didn't take many throws uh, during the course of the week. On Friday, he did a certain amount of throws and shut him down because he wanted to get him some rest, obviously, for the games on Sunday. So I, I think they got a great medical staff uh, there at, with the Colts. They're going to do everything in their power to protect Andrew Luck and get him ready to play. Arizona State head coach Herm Edwards with us, of course, longtime co-worker here with us on NFL Live and also a player in the NFL and a head coach of both the Kansas City Chiefs and the New York Jets. Herm, when you were hired at Arizona State, it was it was a, sort of an interesting philosophy. They're going to bring an NFL approach uh, yeah. to a college team. And some people's uh, feathers got a little ruffled a little bit when you went on a radio station and said, hey, look, man, nobody's guaranteed a slot on this team. And you know, listen, you may still be a student, but you're not necessarily guaranteed to be an athlete, meaning best players are going to play. And some people are like, whoa, wait, what are you doing? You're, you're cutting college players? This happens all the time. You were just letting people know, hey, you need to perform to be able to be on my team, right? Performance-driven business, Coach Wingo, you know that. We all know that. Uh, it's about competition, and you want to create competition within the framework of your team. You want players to understand that, you know, your, your job is to be a student athlete, to handle your affairs uh, in the classroom, also off the field as a student athlete. That goes into the, uh, to the process of evaluating players, but then competing every day. I mean, that's how you get better. That's how teams get better. You know, good teams are driven by the players. 
not by the coach, but by the players. They got to set the tone. So that's all we're saying. And, and these guys have done a nice job of doing that. Well, listen, uh, I, I understood exactly what you're saying. And more importantly, Rody, appreciate you. I knew you were up, so I'm not going to say thanks for getting up early. Yeah, <laughs> you ain't got to wait. You never wake me up, Rody. Anytime you call, I'm always available. As I say, I tell you're, players that too. you're avail- be available, yeah. right, Rody? Be available. And your availability is non-paralleled, my man. Herm, thanks for being with us this morning, Coach. I'll talk to you later, all right? All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. Road Dog's the best. By the way, you guys as former college players, you understood what he was talking about, right, when he said that about, hey, just because you're here doesn't mean you're always going to be here. It's not a new thing. Yeah. We had James Franklin take over when I was after my first year at Vandy, and that was something he said. Yeah. Hey, you don't get to just be here. If you've checked out mentally or you're not cutting it, we'll let you go to school, but you're not going to be on the field anymore. Yeah, this to me was all about the way it was framed, and it was just yeah. different because Herm's not going to be blunt because he hasn't been around and been indoctrinated into a college system for a while, but we remember this happened at Texas when Charlie Strong went there and they were taking the guys that were considered you know, the problem kids out of the program at that point. It's all about how you frame it, and it was framed differently for a lot of people, and so I think the reception kind of reflected that. Well, that's the interesting thing here. I mean, look, we we always say, hey, we don't want players coddled. We we they got to work for it. That's basically what he's saying. Hey, if you want this, you got to earn it. And people, some people, are like, what is he talking about? How can he be? First of all, it's always happened. And B, it's exactly what you want. You want people to fight for their right to do things, right? You want to earn it. You you do want you do want to earn it. And the only thing I would say is making the onus on that because that makes sense to guys. That makes sense to players when you just frame it as cuts. Now all of a sudden you open it, and this because we know Herm, we would never assume. But if you're hearing that just randomly on the street, you're thinking, well, could a kid get cut for something that's not having to do with his hard work? Could a kid get cut for something because a coach doesn't like him? Because that happens at other places too, yeah. where you may not fit a scheme and you may just not be a guy that a coach wanted or counted on getting as a hand me down, and they run those guys out. Too. That's the ugly side of college football. This doesn't sound at all like what that is, but that can be some of the misconceptions. And that's the unfair part because that has to do with the coach recruiting a player. Now it doesn't fit the way he thought. That's on the coach. But uh, trust me, there are players that get that scholarship. Oh, that yeah. was their goal. They check out. And you know what? There's taking up space at that point. Yep. By the way, to your point about what you were talking about, Junior, this is why they're thinking about looking at that rule about transfers. Mm. Uh, and, you know, if, if something has changed, why can't the player have the same flexibility as the coach? That's something else we can talk about later. Hey, everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Love scoring amazing hotel deals? Then you've got to get the Hotel Tonight app. Forget scrolling through never-ending lists of hotels. Hotel Tonight shows you a select list of incredible deals at hotels you actually want to stay at. And even though the name's Hotel Tonight, you can book up to 100 days in advance in top destinations and up to a week in advance everywhere else. Want to get those deals? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Download the Hotel Tonight app now. Golik and Wingo on ESPN Radio, ESPN News. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests will join us on the Shell Penzoil Performance Line. We're getting closer to the uh, start of the NBA playoffs, but we are almost there to the start of the NHL playoffs. And if anybody's ever covered a playoff team in an NHL postseason run, as I did in St. Louis for six years, there's nothing harder to win in all the sports uh, than the Stanley Cup. It, those, those 16 games you're trying to win, it's a war of attrition that you just really cannot understand unless you've been in a locker room after a playoff game. Sometimes it looks like a triage unit. And Eddie Olchick from NBC Sports uh, is joining us now on Golik and Wingo. The NHL playoffs start tomorrow night on the NBC Sports Network and CNBC. Eddie, first and foremost, thanks for being with us, and congratulations on doing well in your battle, battle with colon cancer. It's great to see you up and running and feeling healthy. Uh, Trey, thank you very much. Really appreciate uh, you having me on this morning. And, uh, you know, we did it. I had a lot of support, my team of doctors, uh, my family, my friends. Uh, without them, I, I wouldn't be able to do it by myself. So I'm very thankful to be on the right side of the turf and looking forward to putting it in the rearview mirror and uh, hopefully keeping people away. I mean, one of my missions during my battle with colon cancer has been to try to keep one person away from this horrible disease, and that will be to continue the that will be the mission that I would continue the rest of my life. And hopefully, it's 
it goes into one person a day and uh, because it's, uh, it's a battle. And anybody that goes through uh, this particular disease and has to take chemotherapy, you know, you feel weak, you feel less, you feel like you're a burden. Uh, but anybody that, you know, anybody that takes that medicine, you're the opposite of that. You are tough. Uh, you you know you have to endure and you will conquer and I think that's the belief that you have to have so I'm very thankful that uh, I'm on the right side of the turf and uh, looking forward to the NHL playoffs starting tomorrow as you mentioned. Well you, you certainly have been an inspiration to a lot of people and will continue to be an inspiration Eddie in that battle but let's now talk about the battle for the Stanley Cup. Look I, I covered the St. Louis Blues for six yep. seasons before I got to ESPN. I don't think people truly understand the difficulty it takes to win the cup. There's nothing better than playoff hockey and watching it, but can you explain to it from a, from a player's perspective sometimes what it's like to play back to back nights over time in a, in a game where you're on ice on blades of steel and there is no, sh- <laughs> there is no shortage of hitting in yeah. any way, shape or yeah. form. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to be a small part of a team that won a championship with the New York Rangers in 1994 and, you know, I think the one thing that you know I think people need to realize is that the game is much different. Not not just because today that you know everything is on the line come playoff time, but the game the game is for keeps every shift, and you just never know when that momentum is going to change. And I've had a saying, you know, being in TV and uh, radio the last you know eighteen years since I retired, but also doing some games before I retired in two thousand, is that the rink gets a little smaller in the playoffs. I mean, there's just there's not as much room out there, so every inch really that you fight for is so important. You just never know when a series is going to change on on one play. And you're right. I mean, it is so hard to win, you know, one game, let alone to win those 16 games. But it you need everybody. Uh, you need your stars to be just that. Uh, if you don't have goaltending, you have no chance to win in a Stanley Cup playoff. And uh, you need a little bit of luck. Uh, I don't care what sport it is, whether it's football, baseball, basketball, or hockey, or even horse racing. You need a little bit of luck every once in a while. And I think what we've seen here, Train, you know what the rule changes that have happened in the National Hockey League here over the course of the last 10, 12 years is you go on these swings in games where teams have momentum and there's no stoppages of play. And, and I think it's, it's twofold. One is, is that when you have the momentum, what the hell do you do with it? And when you don't have it, you know, not necessarily how do you get it back on your side, but what do you do to stop it, and then what do you do to get it back on your side? So we've seen these momentum swings and playoffs, which have been the difference. And you're right, go two, three, four overtimes to give yourself the fight, you know, to get an opportunity to play the next day. So it is a battle. You need 25, you need 28 guys to be able to do it. And uh, it, it's something that uh, is, is, pretty inca- is pretty incredible when you look at the journey of all these teams. And, oh, by the way, the Pittsburgh Penguins are looking to do it for the third time in a row, right. which would be just absolutely incredible in a, in a salary cap era. And why don't we stick with there? I mean, obviously you have a ton of familiarity with that franchise, but going for their third in a row, uh, how much pressure does that add to a team that we know is capable of it but now bears the weight of history as well throughout the course of this postseason? You know what, Junior, when you have a guy by the name of Sidney Crosby on your team, and I happened to be his first coach when I was coaching in Pittsburgh back uh, a long time ago, uh, I, that's, that's one thoroughbred that I would not uh, dismiss. Uh, Sidney Crosby is able to raise his game and raise the game of other players around them, regardless of their skill level, and uh, they've proven it, right? They've won three championships with Sidney Crosby there. Look, the supporting cast is is really, really good, too. But when you do have that one guy that just seems to want, and that has the want and the will and shows everybody he doesn't want to be denied, regardless of the situation, regardless of what the, you know, what the series may be, uh, he he just is able to to rally the troops. And it's tough to win, let alone one, and then go back to back. And, yeah, there was was a, a World Cup of hockey sandwiched in there. So, I mean, you know, you get some guys on that team in particular in Pittsburgh they have played a lot of hockey here, and here they are, you know, going for their third, you know, going for their three-peat. So I, I just look at what Pittsburgh's been able to do. They've had guys step up, whether it's been a guy like Jake Gensel last year that came onto the scene or Connor Sheary or, you know, players like that. I, I just think at the end of the day is that you need your best players to do it, but you also need those guys that maybe people or household names that people may not be familiar with to step up. And, again, I go back to the goaltending. As I said, look, if, if you get average goaltending in a playoff, and Trey, you know this following the Blues, yeah. you're not going to last very long, right? Like, that's just the reality of it. And you got to have your goaltender make the routine save 100% of the time in the playoffs. Uh, 
if they can make those spectacular saves, you know, eight out of 10, nine out of 10, you're going to be okay. But when you put it all in the blender and it comes out, uh, it, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of factors in in, in success come playoff hockey. Eddie, I got to ask you what you make of the playoff format because it's been not the traditional one through eight conference ranking that we had up until yeah. 2013. It's fifth year now. We got yeah. a chance that the top two teams could be knocked out in the second round. Here is this yeah. good for the sport? Or do we need to look at it again? Jordan, I, I, I'm I'm old school, so I'm going to show. Uh, I'm like senior. I, I'm going to show my stripes. I, I, I'm a guy that I'd love to see one versus sixteen, two versus fifteen, on and on throughout both sides. That's not going to happen logistically. What, what I would like to see, at least in each conference, I, I do believe in divisional play, uh, but I, I would I would like in the first round the way that it is, you stay within your division, but then after round one, you reseed, and then you could have a Boston Tampa. Uh, conference final, or you could have a Pittsburgh Washington uh, f- conference final. Uh, so that that would be for me. You get the best of both worlds. You still stay within the divisional, uh, you know, rivalries. And, and you, I mean, how great would that be? I mean, how how awesome would that be to see? You know, I know this is impossible, but I'm just saying, like a Montreal Toronto uh, final, uh, the conference final. Um, so. There's been a lot of talk about it. I'm not sure where the commissioner is, you know, I mean, I know where he is right now on it, but you're right. You you do lose some pretty good teams early in these playoffs, which is kind of unfortunate, but that's the way that the, uh, the so-called puck is bouncing right now and you got to live with it. But again, I I'm, I'm old school. So I would stay within the divisional play in round one, but then reseed all the way through uh, within the conferences until you get to the Stanley cup final. Eddie Olchek of NBC Sports with us, uh, breaking down the start of the NHL playoffs, which will start uh, on Wednesday night. Look, is this going to finally be the year that we see Ovi, Alex Ovechkin, and the Caps make it to the conference finals? For, for one of the best players in the sport for so long, he's never been able to get on that stage. What do you think yeah. the odds are the Caps getting there this year? Trey, I hope so, because I'm tired of talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, really for the first time in a long time, they were kind of under the radar all season long, Trey. They really were. They, yeah. You know, not a lot of people talking about them. The disappointment of the last year, you know, look at it. I mean, it was a gut check time for them. They found a way to get to a game seven, weren't able to, you know, to pull it off and came up short again. They lost some defensemen. You know, the goaltending, uh, you know, I don't want to say there's a controversy going on right now, goaltending wise in Washington, but it certainly looks like, you know, Braden Hopley's getting some push there from Philip Grubauer. But, you know, for, for Ovi, I mean, I, I think what he has done, I, 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 the one thing I've been amazed is not only his goal-scoring ability, one goal shy of 50, by the way, this year, 49 goals in 82 games for the grade eight, but I, I think Trey is that what I've seen in Alexander Ovechkin, he, he, I think he's much more controlled in his game, and I think it has helped his game. He's picking his spots. Look, he is an energetic player. He's not afraid to try to run you through the end boards and put you in the third or fourth row. We know he can score goals. I think that he's conserved his energy a lot more maybe in the last year or so than I've seen him do it. Now, that comes with age. That comes with playing a lot of hockey. But I think that that certainly has helped his game. Now, he's got to get some support, and you got to get some luck, and maybe avoiding the Pittsburgh Penguins would be a great thing. they got the Columbus Blue Jackets in the first round. Who knows what's going to happen with Philly and Pittsburgh, but Sure, looks like it's a possible collision course, but the Capitals are going to have their hands full with the Blue Jackets. Let me just say this: the Columbus Blue Jackets might be one of those teams people aren't talking about, but uh, I hope so for Alexander Ovechkin and, and for the organization there because I mean they've been great for the league, but they've been underachievers. And you know when you have that uh, that stigma with you, it, it's tough to shake until you do it. And the questions are, are, are right because. They haven't been able to do it and get to that third round. Absolutely, and then there's nothing better than the story of the Vegas Golden Knights in their in their inaugural year, making the playoffs and the things they've been able to do. It's been an absolutely great regular season for them. We'll see what happens in the postseason. Eddie, great to talk to you for a variety of reasons, but A, the fact that, as you said, you're here with us and fighting the good fight, and also because you're breaking down what is the most exciting time of the year, the NHL run for the Stanley Cup. Eddie, we appreciate you being with us, man. All the best. Say hi to Senior for me. Thanks for having me, Trey. You Thanks. got See it. You guys. Eddie Olchek is the best. Uh, I, look, I've been fortunate to see a lot of sporting events in my life. Maybe the best sporting event I ever saw live was Game 7, second round of the playoffs, uh, double overtime game, Blues, Red Wings. Unbelievable. Stevie Eisman beats John Casey one nothing in Game 7. It was remarkable.
Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Golic look, look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yeah, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. Russell Westbrook, miraculously, actually not miraculously at all, it most uh, predictably pulled down 18 rebounds uh, in the 115-93 win by the Thunder last night, which means he goes into the final game of the regular season needing 16 boards against the Grizzlies for the second straight season in which he has averaged a double-double. I put it to you, Greg, Jr. and Jordan, actually. Is there any chance this doesn't happen? What are the odds? In your minds, Junior, we start with you, that he will get 16 or more rebounds in that regular season finale, thus averaging a triple-double for the second straight year. I mean, as sure as we'll be here for at least the next five minutes of your life. I, you saw last night already how committed, forget Russ is to this, but the rest of his team kind of going out of the way, the bigs clearing out the lane for him, making sure he's got space to go up and get these rebounds. Because at this point, especially now that they've got their playoff spot secure... What else do you have left? Might as well get it for this guy. We loved the arbitrary stat line last year anyway. Well, sounds nice. Make it twice. That's just a whole bunch of want to. Just a good old-fashioned want to. And like you you mentioned, the team will aid that. If there's any question in the fourth quarter that he's going to get it, you might see a couple tips his direction, some extra hard box outs. It's going to happen. I think what you said is is the most important thing here. Um we we celebrated this so much a year ago because it hadn't happened since Oscar Robertson did it uh, in the early 60s. And then he did it and he won the MVP award. Now, some people think it should have gone to James Harden or LeBron James last year. I get that. I understand. That's fine. But he was given the, the MVP because he had done something that had never happened before or hadn't happened in a long time. Now he's on the verge of doing something that has literally never happened in NBA history. And people are like, oh, yeah. Been there, done that already. We're moving on. And not only he's it done, just it, seems bizarre. He's done it with the teammates that we all said would be the reason he didn't have to anymore. Correct. They added Paul George. They brought in Carmelo Anthony. This was supposed to be a better team, and instead now they're sitting down around what the seventh seed, just barely clam, uh, climbing into the playoffs, and he's still managing to pull this off, really without the rest of us knowing or caring until right now. Uh, again, that I. Look, I understand the arguments why he will not win the MVP, and I get that completely. But to your point, this was supposed to be much harder for him to do this year, and he still pulled it off anyway. We have moved on from this so fast, it's ridiculous. Where are you guys at with the regular season MVP in the NBA? Because I thought about this. It's interesting. Now that they have that award show after the uh, finals are over in late June where they give this award out, it really gets sort of big-footed by the NBA finals MVP. Do we think that's the one we start to put more stock in now? Because when I think of the regular season MVP, it's always this rotating list of criteria and things that we really care about. What does the finals MVP gives us? You're on the best team at the end of the season. You're around late doing it in the time of year that we think is the most important. And you're, in theory, actually the most important person to your team's success at that point. It just seems to hammer the things we love already without all the weird, willy-nilly, arbitrary nature of the regular season. I'm a school of thought that I I think that the regular season MVP should be included in playoffs. I think playoffs should be a part of that. Okay, And the finals MVP different than that. How could it not, though? Because it's a regular season award. You're, You're the I mean, unless you want to change what the award is, which I which is I understand. Does it deserve to go so, to a player that doesn't make the playoffs? Um, no, probably not. So, so then it should be accounted for but, how but, an, a quote-unquote MVP performs with this team in the playoffs. I get that. That's fine. But that's the MVP of the postseason. The MVP of the regular season is the team that, the player they thought that was most valuable. Coming up, we'll be joined by a guy who has a new addition to a wardrobe. And if you play a certain sport, it's the wardrobe piece you want. It's a green jacket. Stay with us. We're back with more after this. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I feel like a whole new person. Disclaimer, you will not become a whole new person. This is impossible. You might be able to join a gym or diet program, buy a new wardrobe, get hair implants, but your DNA and physical form will remain the same. Geico waives any and all liability if you attempt to become a new person, except a cyborg. If you choose to become a half-human, half-cybernetic organism with lasers for eyes, the Geico legal team would be cool with that because, quote, laser eyes are pretty sweet. Pew, 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 end quote. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15%. 